pyramid and the stars, pyramid and the stars. It's going to be a very interesting teaching. So we know that uh, Satan, when he builds up his pyramid, it's supposed to represent something. And then I believe that when we see how the pyramid, it tries to predict and follow. Basically, pyramid is scripture. Pyramid is scripture to the demonic offspring, to the demonic beings. The pyramid tries to predict, follow the pattern of what, how the scriptures operate, how the Lord moves and works. So that's why, you got to realize this, that's why the devil, he knows about the future that there's going to be a Messiah. And that he knows that Jesus Christ, that he is the Messiah. And he knows what the prophecy has spoken about Jesus and his coming and his kingdom. The devil knows all of that. So because of that, he has knowledge himself. And he puts all of that knowledge in the pyramids. Now, the pyramids, it is said that there's a story from the Egyptians how they were able to build their pyramids is that it first started from this small little thing where it looks like a small pyramid. I think, uh, I forgot what they called it, a Ben 10 or something like that. And from this small little pyramid structure or device, this small thing, it's probably maybe this tall or something, that's when the whole creation and the earth was formed. That's how Egyptians claimed their creation, is that from this small little pyramid, thus the earth and everything was born from off of it. Now, why do they teach that? Because, look at Job chapter 38. The Bible says at verse 4, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now notice right here that the Bible reads... That the sons of God, that they were there when God laid the foundation for the earth, right? When the earth was created and formed, those sons of God saw what God did. But when they saw God building that earth, it came with certain structures. They saw the foundation of the earth laid out and it had lines being measured and then here's the big one cornerstone now when you look at all this wording notice this fits well with the pyramid look at that right there I have a cornerstone lines measured and foundation God did that for the earth if those sons of God are the ones who build the pyramids, and you heard me teach that quite often before, if those sons of God were the ones building the pyramids, why did they do that? Because they saw how God built his earth. So when they saw God, how he built his earth, and those Egyptians claimed how the earth was all created was from the small little pyramid, and that's why those Egyptians prized that small pyramid, and that's why they built bigger pyramids. Though that small little pyramid was the one that laid the foundation for a lot of larger structures of the pyramids. Why? Because of those sons of God. They want to build something. Because from what they saw in God's creation long ago. That's why they built the pyramid. Why? Because they saw how God created the earth. And the pyramid is supposed to imitate something that God did. It's to follow the pattern of how God did his creation. If you watch my other video, Pyramid Shape of the Universe, Pyramid Shape of the Universe, that's going to be very eye-opening. That's how all God's creation is uh, revolved around. It's a pyramid shape. That's why the sons of God built it. So yeah, I think those sons of God, they were the ones that would make sense with those giants that they produced and the knowledge that they had. They would be the ones capable for building the pyramids. Why so? Because of Job 37. Job 37, they're the ones that saw God, how he created his earth. And all of his creation it follows a pyramid pattern. 
Those sons of God saw it. That's why they have the wisdom to do it. And that's the reason why when you look at those pyramids today, for some weird reason, they just line up accurately with certain stars and patterns of the universe. How can people who are uncivilized and people from the old days ever uh, follow uh, that kind of method without such advanced technology? It's because of those sons of God. That's why. So that's the reason why I would believe that the sons of God are responsible for building the pyramids. But uh, here's uh, something else that's interesting about the pyramids. Let's look at Revelation 12, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Notice that when we look at Revelation chapter 12, this being, he's going to come out during the tribulation. And in the tribulation, he's going to try to conquer God up in heaven, but obviously he falls apart and he fails. Let's look at Revelation chapter 12. The Bible says at verse 3, And there appeared... Another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail do, drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. So notice right here, if there is somebody who has knowledge of the universe and the stars up there, that would be Satan, the dragon. Because his tail drew a third of those stars. He definitely has access. He definitely knows. Now for some of you who don't know, which is extremely interesting about the pyramids, one of their windows where it lines up, it follows one of the certain stars up there. And one of the stars that the pyramid windows is trying to aim for is, believe it or not, the head most important part is the dragon. The star of the dragon. Why does Satan want? Why does Satan want the pyramid to face toward him? I wonder. Why does he want all the attention and worship? Because he thinks he's important. That's why he believes that he's an important creature. He wants the universe to revolve around him. So the pyramid, that is intensely interesting. It shows demonic activity then behind this. It shows that the sons of God would definitely know that. And they tried to point out to Satan over there. It makes you wonder, why would certain pyramids aim towards certain stars in the universe? Could it be when Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, that Satan casts the stars down to the earth, they might be landing toward their home down here after that battle in the tribulation. Who knows? But Satan, there's no doubt he's trying to reach up for God when he's building these pyramids. Look at Isaiah 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Satan's job is to go high, follow certain star patterns so that why? He can attain Godhood, basically beat God at his game. That's why the pyramid structure is built where it's facing, it's trying to point up, up. That's Satan's mentality when you look at Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above, notice, the stars of God. So God's stars... He wants his throne to go above it. That's why he's directly aiming for the stars for some weird reason. Let's keep reading. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Isn't that interesting? He wants to sit in the sides of the north, mount of the congregation. Why do you think Satan built something like a mount over here? And the sides... They try to point toward the north. There's no doubt the pyramids that they were built 
it screams of demonic activity. There's no doubt about it. Satanic elements. That's what Satan wants. When the pyramid is built, you got to think about it. These architects and these people had something in their mind when they were building that. And their mindset, notice, follows Isaiah 14. That kind of mindset. Hit toward the stars, sides of the north, hit the mount. It matches up very well over there. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I wonder who follows that mentality. Go to Genesis. Go to the book of Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Now, when people talk about pyramids in the Bible, some people are wondering, where is pyramids? When, where are pyramids mentioned in the Bible? So pyramid, the word pyramid, is not mentioned in the Bible. But there is something very interesting that the Lord points out, all right, when you study the history of the pyramids. When they study the history of the pyramids, they say it was supposed to, uh, how they were able to build the pyramids is because first you had those ziggurats. And those ziggurats, once they had those first, then they later were able to follow along with the pyramids. But if you look at those ziggurats, those things which are like, uh, it kind of looks funny when you look at those ziggurats. What do they kind of look like? Well, you know, if you were to look at those things, Let's see. It kind of looked like a uh, Tower of Babel, maybe? Did you notice that right there? Looks like a Tower of Babel. That's the history of the pyramids, they say. And I'm talking about secular historians, too. I'm not talking about scriptural people. But now let's get on the theological side. You know what's interesting in the theological side is that what the Hebrews, obviously they didn't use the word pyramid in their language. The word that they would use is migdol. Migdol. When you look up that word in your Bible, migdol, guess what? The first mention, Tower of Babel, Genesis. How about that, huh? That's what they would call the pyramids in Hebrew is Migdal. But the first mention of that, isn't it interesting, is the Tower of Babel. Why? Satan tried to do something. And then the Egyptians followed along. Look at Genesis 11. What is Satan trying to do? It's pretty obvious. Isaiah 14. I want to hit the stars. Build on the sides of the north. Hit the mountain, mount of God. I want to be like the Most High. Genesis 11. Look at the Bible, what it says right here, verse 4. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a what? Tower. There's your Hebrew migdol right there. Whose top may what? Reach unto heaven. Isn't that Isaiah 14? I'm going to go up, ascend to heaven. That's what Lucifer said. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Why do you think God went to ruin the tower then? He don't like what they're doing. He don't like what this pyramid's doing. Why? Because he doesn't see it as just a tall building. He sees something more. They're trying to hit some... Uh, it's demonic mindset trying to attain godhood. That's what they're trying to do. Let me show you something interesting too. The Bible doesn't mention pyramid, but it does mention its element. All right, keep your hand at Genesis 11. I want you to go to the book of Exodus, all right? Go to the book of Exodus. Those Jews, when they were in bondage under Pharaoh, you know what they were doing? They were helping in the construction of the pyramids and the smaller structures in Egypt. Look at, at the book of Exodus, and we'll look at chapter 5, chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. You know how we know that they were building the pyramids? It's because of the ingredients they used. What was the ingredients used for the pyramids? What they had to use was definitely those bricks. And, you know, when they used those bricks, 
the Josephus, it is very interesting what he mentioned is that those Jews, what they were doing when they were building those, uh, using those bricks, creating bricks, was creating the pyramids for the pharaohs. So this is where you get your mention, your indication of the pyramid. The closest would be Exodus chapter 5, verse 6. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall give no more the people straw to make brick, as heretofore, let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tail of the bricks which they did make heretofore ye shall lay upon them, ye shall not diminish aught thereof. So how about that? Those Jews, they were using the bricks to create those pyramids. But guess what? That is not your first mention of mankind using man-made element bricks to create some kind of man-made tower or pyramid. You know what the first mention of that is? Genesis 11. Go back there. That, that's not of God. God was what? It was God made. Nature. When God told Noah to build a what? An ark. Not a tower. Not a pyramid. He wanted him to build an ark using his natural elements from the trees, from his creation. Not man made right here. Why do you think the altar, God doesn't want it man-made? He wants it natural, uncut stones. Look at Genesis chapter 11. Read right here, first mention. Who taught them that, I wonder? You ever thought about that? Who taught them that? Genesis chapter 11. Could Satan have done something behind the scenes through Nimrod? Makes you wonder. Verse 3, verse 3. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them truly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower. Those Egyptians learned it something, they had some previous knowledge from somewhere. All the way back. Satan, he's trying to do something. He's trying to connect to the heavens. Makes you wonder what he's doing. Okay. Now in the tribulation... What's going to happen? All right, I want you to go to Isaiah 19 and Revelation 11. Isaiah 19 and Revelation 11. I want you to go to Isaiah 19 and Revelation chapter 11. Now, this one is only a possibility. This is not uh, something that's truth or doctrine. This is something that's possible. Because remember Isaiah 14, Satan, he tried to do something. And there's no doubt when you look at the, when they try to create the Tower of Babel, it's imitating the pyramid, right? Can we agree with that? All right, there's no doubt about that. The mentality of the Tower of Babel is the same as Isaiah 14. Can we agree with that? Yes, let's reach up to heaven when we build this pyramid. Now when Satan says that Isaiah 14, you got to realize this. For some of you who don't know, Isaiah 14, part of that passage doctrinally applies to the tribulation. Part of that passage applies to the tribulation. You might say, why? Because God says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell and all the nations are going to see you fall and burning in hell. That's undoubtedly tribulation timeline. This didn't happen right now or a long time ago. So this is future. So there's a partial application there that's for the tribulation. If that mentality of Satan that we're going to build something that will reach up to heaven is in the future tribulation, and that was the mentality when they built that pyramid and the Tower of Babel, could it be that in the tribulation they might build some kind of pyramid when the Antichrist sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem? It might be possible. Why? Because look what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 11. The Antichrist in verse 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast, the Antichrist, that ascendeth out of the bombless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is Jerusalem, right? Which spiritually is called what? Sodom and what? Why would God call it Egypt? 
where also our Lord was crucified. Jerusalem. Why would God call it Egypt? Unless something Egyptian is going to go on over there. Isn't that interesting? Could be Satan might be trying to do that. Why? Because he has unfinished business at Genesis 11 that God ruined. He's like, I'm going to continue it. We're going to make sure that we're one world. You scattered us in different languages, but we got Google now. We got YouTube. We got Facebook. We got, uh, we're international. We got the United Nations, you know. We got uh, everybody in line. We got the EU. We got UNESCO. We got everybody. We're all in it together. You can't stop us now. And we're going to continue where you ruined us, God. We're going to continue where we left off. We're going to build it up. And we're going to fight you. And we're going to battle you. And God's like, ha <laughs> Right? So they're going to do something with this connection right here. Look at Isaiah 19. Now, here's something that's very interesting. It could, also, it could also be this, is that when Satan sets up his Egypt in Jerusalem, there's going to be the people in Egypt who are going to feel hurt and betrayed by the Antichrist, or they're going to seek after God. And that's going to happen in the tribulation. There's going to be some people in Egypt that are going to seek after God. And when they do this, guess what they're going to do? Just like what their civilization has done, they're going to try to build some kind of tower as well or altar. Look at Isaiah chapter 19, verse 18. Isaiah 19, verse 18. The Bible says, In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to the Lord of hosts, one shall be called the city of destruction. In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. So there's this tall thing that's pointing upward then that they're building. Some kind of pillar thing. And they're going to build it to the Lord in the land of Egypt. Verse 20, And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. So this has to connect to God then. Whatever this thing they're building, it has to connect to God up there. It's supposed to be a witness that ties to Him. Why isn't that interesting? The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Those are the stars up here that they're supposed to show God's glory. Could it be that they're building a structure that might connect to the stars to try to be a witness to the Lord since the heavens are His glory? And if that's the case, could it be then that they're maybe building a pyramid or they're reclaiming one of the pyramids over there and claim it for the Lord? Could it be? If we keep reading, uh, For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a Savior and a great one, and he shall deliver them. There's Jesus Christ. He's going to come down be the Savior for Egypt during the last days when the Antichrist takes over. How about that? So it could be they might be building a pyramid, or they might just reclaim one of their pyramids over there and then change it for the Lord. So, that's very po so that might be possible. That is intensely interesting. Okay, so understanding all this, what we know so far is that these things are supposed to connect to the heavens then, the stars, the celestial bodies. If the pyramids are supposed to connect to these stars and these celestial bodies, uh, why are they doing that? Because they're trying to follow God's pattern and His ways. What you got to realize throughout the scriptures, the stars and the pattern, the celestial bodies in our universe, each and every one of them symbolize something and prophesy something of what's going to happen to us in the future. You didn't know that, huh? That's, uh, so the scriptures will show you how it ties to celestial bodies that give a prophecy about us and about our future. So Satan, that's why he had to build his scripture right here to tie to celestial bodies to imitate the prophecy and the future. And guess what? The prophecy and the future in the end is that they tie it to dragon, Satan. He's going to win. He's going to be on top, not Jesus Christ. But God says it differently. Look at the book of Peter. Here's another mention in your Bible. Look at the book of 1 Peter. Chapter... Uh, 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, and then we'll read verse 6. 1 Peter chapter 1, and then we'll read verse 6. Jesus Christ, 
He sees himself as the chief cornerstone. And when Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, yes, he's the foundation for the bottom, all right? But it also applies to the top too. And that's referring to the top at that pyramid over there. Jesus Christ, he's saying, no, I'm the top. But notice that the pyramids, they want to connect to Satan as being the top. If you don't believe me, look at this one. Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus Christ, right? The last part of verse 5, Jesus Christ. What is Jesus Christ? Verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a cheap cornerstone. It's a cornerstone. The pyramids in Egypt, they all refer to this as a cornerstone. But this cornerstone is not like a... It can refer to foundation bottom, I realize, for buildings. But not in this case, because keep reading here. The Bible says, Chief cornerstone, elect precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient... The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. You know what the Bible also says? It's going to grind them to powder. That's what the Bible shows. It's going to grind them to powder, that stone. So it shows right here, if it's going to be uh, something like that, if we go back at, uh, oh, ah, well, I'll just say Daniel chapter 4 and then verse 44, J Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 through 45. We're not going to read it for time's sake. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 through 45. So it's, the Bible talks about a stone cut out of the mountain. See that? There's no doubt. This matches with the pyramid. And then what? It breaks them to pieces. How can a foundation at the bottom do that, foundation stone? It has to be something from the top that falls and then crushes them, grinds them to powder. All right, how about that? So then that's what Jesus Christ sees himself. But then Satan wants that pyramid to imitate him. That's why you got that all-seeing eye at the back of your dollar bill. You got the masons, masonry connected to that. And by the way, the people involved in the building of the pyramids, secular historians would say, are masons. That's why Freemasons took that name for themselves as their, as their cult and their society name. It's all tied. It's all tied right here. There's so many interesting references. So then, if Jesus Christ sees himself as the chief cornerstone, and then the script, and he ties himself to celestial bodies. Again, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. So then, it's, he connects himself to the heavenly bodies. Then I wonder how the scripture shows how each celestial body represents. This is fun. All right, let's start out at the beginning, at the beginning, the timeline of Jesus, shall we? Go to Numbers 24 and Matthew 2. Numbers 24. And Matthew 2. The, again, the Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. Right? Let's see how each celestial body represents God's glory and symbolizes God's glory. It gives a prof it gives a prophecy, each celestial body. Now uh, I'm not referring to astrology. That's something that Satan wants to do. He wants to read the signs in the heavens and then uh, pr produce some kind of prophecy and stuff like that. That's not the idea. The idea is this, is that God created each celestial body to symbolize and to picture and represent something that's supposed to fulfill prophecy found in his scripture. That's the idea. So look at this now. We're going to look at book of Numbers chapter 24 and let's start with the timeline of Jesus. Let's start out with one star, a very important star and that's called the star out of Jacob. Star out of Jacob and that is what? The birth of Jesus Christ. Alright, look at Numbers chapter 24. 
Notice it's known as the star out of Jacob. The Bible reads, uh, let's let's see right here, uh, Numbers chapter 24, and then read verse 19. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Who is this one out of Jacob? Verse 17, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. That's obviously Jesus. Star out of Jacob, Matthew 2.2. 2. The birth of Jesus. The king was born. Matthew 2.2, 2, a star out of Jacob. Matthew 2.2, 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. So a star comes out of Jacob. And then when we see this star out of Jacob, Jesus Christ died on the cross. We know that he died. And then thus began the church age, right? When the church age started right here, God called this the night. Look at Romans 13. Romans 13. We start out with a star out of Jacob, star of Jacob, and now what we come next is the night. The church is known as the moon. Look at John chapter 1, John chapter 1. Here we go, the queen of the night, or the empress of the night. Look at Romans 13 and John chapter 1. Notice that uh, we are not our own light. We're reflecting the light from Jesus, right? The moon is what? It doesn't have its own light. It's supposed to reflect the light from the sun. Jesus is known as the sun, S-O-N, as well as the sun, S-U-N. We all know that. Take it for granted at Malachi 4 if you don't believe me. But if that's the case, that's why we reflect the light of Jesus. And the moon reflects the light from the sun. So let's look at John chapter 1. That's what the Bible says at verse... Uh, verse 4, excuse me, verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. So we carry that light. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Notice we people carry the light from Jesus, and it shines in darkness. That's your moon. Look at uh, verse 8. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, Jesus, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That's us. So then we reflect the light. So that's the church now that believe on Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're in the time of the night. Look at Romans 13. Romans 13. As you can see, I like to keep saying this, your Bible study is so boring. It is so boring. There's nothing to learn off of this. Let's look at Romans chapter 13. The Bible says right here at verse uh, 12, The night is what? Far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Notice that Paul's saying that we Christians are in the night. We are in the night, and the night's almost over. And what we are in the night, let's look at the book of Mark, chapter 13. Mark, chapter 13. You know what you and I are? We're watchers. We're supposed to watch for Jesus to come for us, to rapture us, right? And when we watch for him, we have to be watching on certain parts of the night right here. Mark, chapter 13. And then read verse 35. Watch ye therefore. You know, there are watchers of the night. I don't know if you knew that. There are those watchers of the night. That's why they'll call out at the night, those watchers. But we are the watchers as well. But look at this. For ye know not when the master of the house cometh. So when Jesus, our master, comes for us to rapture us. At even... 
uh, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. There are your four watches. So we're in the first watch right here, which is evening. And this is going by the Jewish clock as well. Jewish timeline, they go like this in the Bible. So they have a first watch, which is not like our clock system. It goes from 6 to 9. Then we go to the second watch, which is midnight over here. And that goes from 9 to 12. 9 to 12. Then we get to the third watch over here. And the third watch is the cock crowing. And the cock crowing will be from 12 to 3. 12 to 3. And then the fourth watch, which is the morning, the morning, which will be uh, from, let's see right here, three to six, three to six. As we go through the night, all of a sudden go to Second Peter 1, Second Peter chapter 1. And then I want you to go to 2 Peter chapter 1, as well as 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 1. Now we hit day star. The day star comes. And that is your rapture. Your rapture. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Notice that the Bible says at verse 19. So what are we doing? We're walking by faith, not by sight. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So the church, we Christians are living by the word of God, right? Until, until a specific time. So the church keeps living by the word of God until what? We get raptured, right? Right. The Bible shows we're living by the word of God until the day star arises. Like a second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Right at the night, we're going by the moonlight, and we're going by the word until a specific day. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Until that day star comes. That day, right? 1 Corinthians 1. That day is the coming of Jesus Christ when he raptures us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 7. Verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 7. So that he come behind in no gift, waiting for what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the what? Day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus Christ has a day. That's why it's called the day star. Now look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. You know what happens to us at the rapture? We become the stars following this day star. That's what happens to us at the rapture. We are the stars that follow along. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Isn't that the famous rapture, pass, uh, rapture passage? Look at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The famous rapture passage. The Bible says at verse, let's see right here, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's our rapture passage, right? In our rapture, we receive this resurrection 
And what does God call this resurrection? Go to the verse 40. Verse 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrials, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. See, at the rapture, we become the stars. But notice that the Bible says the stars differ from another star in glory. Why are we all different in our levels of shining? Is there something where Christians distinguish each other on different levels on what they do? Amen. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. Hence, now we come to the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. The judgment seat of Christ is what? It's one star differeth another star in glory. Amen. So that's the star differing. Star differeth from another star. So then all these different stars you see outside that shine differently, act differently, stuff like that, there's your judgment seat of Christ. We can accurately say that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Bible says at verse 12, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Remember, right? That day, the day star that we go up, because it shall be revealed by fire. So this day is going to show, this day star, this day is going to reveal those other stars by fire, their differences. Amen. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. How about that? The quality of every man's work is going to be tried as they are a star during that day star. How about that? And by the way, let me give you a bonus right here. You re remember how the foundation, right, of the pyramid is supposed to connect to the stars? Isn't it interesting that the Bible gives that reference at verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid. If you build upon this foundation, verse 12, gold, silver, precious stones. How about that? Isn't that interesting? We're tied to pyramids too. How about that? No wonder Satan wants to build his pyramid because he sees something what we're going to become, what Jesus is doing, and he's trying to imitate all of that. Now, let me show you another one. Look at the book of uh, Revelation 9, uh, Daniel 12, Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. And we're going to look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Excuse me. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Notice right here that we come across... Wow, there's just... Uh, I'm going to have to... I don't have room over here, so I'm going to have to... Let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm going to have to just put, put it over here then, okay? So, notice that now we got the star different from another star in glory. But then now the stars that shine. Now we got the stars that shine in their glory, in their fullness of it. The stars that shine. Look at Daniel chapter 12. We'll read verse 3. And they that be wise, isn't that you and I? Shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. It's the stars' fullness in their glory. Is there something that will happen in the future where the stars will shine in its full glory? Yes, look at Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because why? The wife hath made herself ready. She is shining in her full splendor. Amen. How about that? So now we got the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
That's when the stars shine. Now we got shining stars now. Shining stars. So here they are at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Up there. That book's an amazing book, I'll tell you that much, man. The book meets more than meets the eye. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Look at the wording right here. She is ready. She's in her full splendor and glory. She's shining. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his what? Wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is a righteousness of saints. See, she's in her full glory. She is shining, dazzling. All right. Then we go down to the book of Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Uh, excuse me, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Oh my, is it already this time? I gotta wrap it up then. Okay. Okay, so then we got the rapture. And then obviously what's going on over here is the tribulation. That man of sin is revealed. And then the tribulation, what happens to the weather pattern here? The sun is darkened. The moon is darkened. Everything is dark. We got the night with the moon, but this one is just dark. Now we come here, the darkest hour before the dawn. That's the tribulation. The tribulation is the darkest hour, but before the dawn. Why? Because compare that with Malachi as well. Malachi 4. The dawn, the sunrise, is Jesus Christ's second coming. But before then, it's going through a very, very dark hour, and that's the tribulation. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Notice what the Bible says. At verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, the power of the heavens shall be shaken. See, it's darkness. But then, just before the dawn, look at Malachi 4. Malachi 4, here's your sunrise. Sunrise is the second advent. The second advent. Sunrise is your second advent. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 4, we'll read verse 2, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And what? Verse 3, he destroys the wicked, the Antichrist people, at verse 3. All right. We're also going to go to the book of Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And then we're going to jump to uh, 2 Peter 3. We have to uh, jump to these places. I want to get you out of here, okay? I don't want you to stay late again. So I want to respect time. Go to 2 Peter 3. And then the last, uh, the last one, well, we're going to go to four places, okay? 2 Peter 3. And then we're going to go to Revelation 20. Revelation 20. And then we're going to go to uh, Pro uh, Proverbs chapter... Oh, well, actually, no. We'll just go to three places, all right? And then the other two verses, I'll just quote it to you. All right, we'll do it that way. All right, let's go to 1 Peter 3. And then uh, 2 Peter, excuse me, 2 Peter 3. Revelation 20. And then Matthew chapter 13, verse 4. Then we come to the millennium. When God sets up his kingdom on the earth. When God sets up his kingdom on the earth, the Bible says that it's going to be bright day. It's going to be a good day. 
it's going to be the full or millennial day. The Bible says, verse, 42, uh, verse 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. So we come to the full millennial day. All right, but then what happens is that day, it's going to hit the very heat of the day. All right, go to the book of 2 Peter. Chapter 3. Now you're going to hit the heat of the day over here. So the millennium... is the full day right here. Full shiny day. And over here is what? It is when heaven and earth burns up, the end of the millennium. And God, and notice right here, so this would be the, oh, the renovation of the earth. The earth destroyed by fire, all right? The destruction of heaven and earth, and this is referred to as the heat of the day. Notice at the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says here, yeah, ah, I just lost my place here. Okay, the Bible says, verse uh, 10, but the day, right? of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall melt with what? Fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now go to Revelation 20. Revelation 20. You come to the great white throne judgment after God sends that fire down from heaven. If you don't believe me, Revelation chapter 20 verse 7 through 11, that's what happened. Earth and heaven destroyed at, the, at that fire. Then you come to the great white throne judgment. And the great white throne judgment, what happens? There is no day, no night. There is no day and there is no night. Why? Because it fled away. Night and day fled away. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And then we concluded off with where the Bible reads that the, uh, you can write these two passages down, but it will be Revelation chapter 21, all right, and 22. And then the second passage is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Proverbs 4, 18. You know what the Bible says at Proverbs 4, 18? That when a person becomes more and more righteous and things become more and more holy, it calls it the perfect day. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. What happens now is outside of all of this, we finally hit a plane of perfect day. What is the perfect day? If you read Revelation 21 and 22, there is no doubt everything is perfect. And every, there is no night there. And that everything is perfect. And the just is shining more and more. Just Amen. like Proverbs chapter Amen. 4 mentioned. So what do we see right here about the pyramids and the stars? Man, do you see prophecy here? Starts out with the star of Jacob when Jesus Christ was born. And then it, we hit the night time where we hit the church age, the queen of the night. And we're reflecting the light of Jesus Christ as the moon, going through four watches, waiting when our Jesus Christ will return within these four watches. And then finally, the day star comes. Jesus Christ comes up for us, and then we get raptured up to heaven. Becoming his stars, we are stars that differ from another star in glory. Why? Because of the judgment seat of Christ, where all of our qualities differ in our work. And then during that time, we down there, the tribulation is going through the darkest hour before the dawn. The darkest hour 
uh, before the dawn, excuse me. Why? Because over there, the sun, moon, and everything blotted out. In the meantime, the marriage supper of the Lamb is going on because the stars are, are the ones that are shining, the stars that shine. And the wife has made herself ready. She is shining and glowing. And because it's called darkest hour before the dawn for the tribulation, that must mean the second advent is the dawn, according to Malachi chapter 4. When Jesus Christ comes down, slaughters his enemy, that is sunrise. And then the sun will be in its full aspect at the full day. The sun shining for a thousand years at the millennium. But pretty soon that sun's going to set and the sun's going to fall. It's going to be the heat of the day. And that heat of the day, the earth and the heaven will be destroyed. That is quite a sunset over there. And then what happens is at the great white throne judgment, no day and no night. And then finally we hit the perfect day. There's your King James Bible right there. Let's close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I pray tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.